and uh, we're back uh, in uh, Nina and uh, this time I'm going to try to show you how to set up a sequence. I'm not even going to try to show you, I'm going to show you. Uh -huh. So first things first, uh, what I typically do, I mean you can simply go into sequence there and you know just put in your target coordinates and that's very important if you keep them to zero and then you set slew to target uh, the telescope will slew to those coordinates which, ver which very likely will make it point to the ground. Congratulations, you don't want that to happen. So you could totally, like, you know, go to here, um, say, like, target one will be these coordinates, give it a name, uh, which will be used for me in the in the file name as I, uh, as I showed it earlier here. And uh, then you can set up your options for that particular target. Uh, do you want it to start guiding at the beginning? And you definitely do want to start guiding, by the way, if you have a guider or if you have the ditherer that I, uh, I used earlier uh, because uh, Nina will not pause guiding while it's doing autofocus or while it's doing plate solving. It will actually stop it. Uh, this is because of some issues uh, we've noticed with the way that PhD2 um, kind of reacts to the pause command. So you really want to have start guiding on here. Uh, it probably should be uh, on by default, but that's another discussion. Uh, you can delay the starts by a certain amount of time. Uh, you can choose, um, here you can have multiple sequence items, right? One per filter, for example. You can choose whether you want to do one after another. So completely do like uh, 20 exposures uh, for this one and then 30 exposures one after another or do you want to do uh, rotate through so you'll do one exposure of this then one exposure of this then one exposure of this then one exposure of this etc which can be good if you're doing uh, like LRGB uh, you have your and you have filter offsets set up and you have an autofocuser right so um, that way you you're sure to capture all of the color data at the same time even if there's clouds rolling in you didn't miss like part of the spectrum because you were able to rot rotate through. Uh, you also have a uh, slew to target whether it's on and off you probably want to keep, there, keep it on and center target will be using this plate solver to try to uh, basically s uh, center the target before it starts. And then you have uh, the, uh, the autofocus here and uh, the autofocus is basically, um, well, you know, you can, what you may want to like have an autofocus round go on, on start, on filter change, after a certain time has elapsed, after a certain number of exposures, after a certain temperature change, if your focuser has a temperature gauge that is uh, usable by Nina, uh, I think mine does, and yes, it, it has the temperature as 22 degrees. Uh, my camera is at minus 10 as expected. Um, okay, so uh, let's go back to the sequencer. And so you can do whatever you want in terms of the autofocus here. Uh, by the way, the target that you set, you can see here you have a nice little chart about showing you where is the current time, when is like the nice dark uh, darkness of the sky versus like pre-dawn uh, during the dusk. Uh, and then you can see the target elevation there. So that's super convenient when you're setting up your sequence. And yes, you can absolutely set up your sequence. Say you're gonna take 20 exposures of uh, 30 seconds each. Those are light frames with the L filter. There will be no bidding. I, will going, I am going to dither every three frames. And I can also put in a, a default gain for that particular uh, step, which will override the gain here, and actually to be even clearer, it will overwrite the gain here. So if I put like gain 300 here and then nothing in the rest, it doesn't revert back to 200 as in here, it will actually keep the 300, at least as far as I could see in the code. Um, so something to just keep in mind. I, I personally haven't used like the different gain per exposure, but if you do LRGB H alpha, for example, you'll probably want a different gain uh, for H alpha than you'll want for LRGB. Typically I'd use like 76 uh, for LRGB and uh, 139 to 200 uh, for narrowband. Um, okay, and you could add more targets, by the way, at the top. You could say like, okay, kit, click on the plus button. Uh, so no, that adds, sorry, items to a target. The plus button at the top right. 
and you go to the second target, so first target, second target, and same story. You just set up your sequence. Uh, you can save your sequence once you're done, and as we saw, we can uh, load a sequence from an uh, XML file, or and then you can start your sequence, and that will just start the capture. So starting the capture will start the guiding, I mean, for at least the first target, <laughs> start the guiding, slew the target, center the target via plate solving, do an autofocus round, then start uh, on the L filter here with a dither every three frames, and then an autofocus after certain conditions. I typically do just an autofocus, uh, not on start, uh, because of my procedure before I launch uh, the sequence, but just after a certain time has elapsed and on filter change. And I really should get rid of this on filter change by just having my filter offsets properly set up in the equipment tab of the options panel. Uh, so that's how you can set up a, a sequence kind of manually. There are helps to uh, set up a sequence. There is in particular the Sky Atlas. And the Sky Atlas, you can look for objects. So I could look for M31. We can see, oh, wow, it's already that season. Huh. Okay, that M31 will be out soon. I could be looking for M16, the Eagle Nebula, and, uh, and image it. And um, and you can see I also get the pictures there. This is something I forgot to mention during the setup video. If you go to Options General, you have the Sky Atlas Image Directory, and uh, this Sky Atlas Image Directory um, is necessary for these pictures here to be displayed. If not, they're not going to be in there. And uh, the way you get it is from the Nina website under uh, download. Uh, there should be the Sky Atlas image uh, repository here. Uh, it's a big file. Uh, the creator of the software pays for the bandwidth. So download it once and then share it amongst your computers if you have several. In other words, be nice. Um, OK, so that's uh, how you get it. Now, once it's downloaded, it's a zip file. You can unzip it somewhere. Personally, I just unzipped it in the Nina directory uh, proper, the installation directory, and then you need to point to it in here, uh, in this menu. Um, and once it's done, it's pointed to it. The pictures will automatically appear here. Now, what's very nice is that you can say set a sequence target here, and uh, it will set it as a sequence tar target for M16. You can see the coordinates are in, and then if I clicked uh, start, it would actually slew the telescope. Um, of course, by the way, you could just go into telescope there, put some targets and click slew, and it would slew there. Uh, I can go back to Sky Atlas as well, go to, uh, well, let's keep M16, click slew, and this the telescope is actually currently moving um, to, that, uh, to that target. Um, so that's something uh, that's uh, that's quite convenient. Another button that I like to use a lot, uh, and by the way, the search you can search by object type, constellation, etc. This is pretty uh, pretty self-explanatory. Is instead of setting it directly as sequence target, you can set it for the framing assistant. And uh, the framing assistant is this thing here. Uh, you could just be putting in your coordinates with the name of the target manually here. But it's just far easier to be in the Sky Atlas, uh, select an item set for framing assistant, and you can see the Eagle Nebula has been set. And I'm currently using it offline framing from the Sky Atlas for when you're on the go. So you have an actual like atlas going on there that you can uh, go around and search for objects and do stuff, and it's uh, it's pretty good. And of course, for computing this field of view, it's using my camera. Uh, pixel width and height uh, as get gotten from the camera it's getting the pixel size as well from there which you remember was here and it's also uh, getting the focal length which can be a separate actually number but it can get from here uh, you want to make sure that those parameters are correct or the framing doesn't make any sense. Now I'm using on offline framing, so I'm not getting pictures. Uh, I could use the NASA Sky Survey and click on Load Image, and it will load uh, the image from the NASA Sky Survey. It's very well known to be a bit too bright, uh, but it's still very usable to do uh, framing. 
Uh, plus you can have like multiple targets with multiple uh, panels, uh, both uh, horizontally and vertically with different like rotations, which can be useful with a rotator or a manual uh, rotator. Um, here for the, uh, uh, here's the, my Eagle Nebula. You can see now how I'm framing it here. And uh, I could be adding multiple uh, items here. Um, so that's like, and when you're you're done framing that thing, and uh, yeah, Nina stopped uh, responding for some reason. Yeah, it's back. Sorry, um, it was actually my remote desktop <laughs> that had issues. So here I can like set up my uh, my field of view. I could say that I want to do a mosaic like this, it's twenty percent overlap. And I want to uh, add all of this as uh, sequence targets or replace them as sequence targets or just slew there and add a sequence target. And there we are, Eagle Nebula panel one, panel two, panel three, panel four. So it's all very, uh, very easy to set up. And then you can set up your exposures in there. Click on the play button and it will launch your sequence. It's as easy as that. Um, okay, so that's it for uh, the sequence and uh, there's another video about the initial setup and there's going to be another video as well about how I use like the imaging tab and uh, yeah, pretty much the imaging tab to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, prepare for my imaging session. Thanks for watching.